Section 41 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty three Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, part seven. We recall to mind here what was but lately said in this very chapter as to the condition of minds and morals in the sixteenth century, and as to the tragic consequences of it. Massacre, we add no qualifying term to the word, was an idea a habit, we might say almost a practice, familiar to that age, and one which excited neither the surprise nor the horror which are inseparable from it in our day. So little respect for human life and for truth was shown in the relations between man and man. Not that those natural sentiments which do honour to the human race were completely extinguished in the hearts of men, they reappeared here and there as a protest against the vices and the crimes of the period but they were too feeble and too rare to struggle effectually against the sway of personal passions and interests against atrocious hatreds and hopes against intellectual aberrations and moral corruption to betray and to kill were deeds so common that they caused scarcely any astonishment and that people were almost resigned to them beforehand we have cited fifteen or twenty cases of the massacres which in the reign of Charles the Ninth, from 1562 to 1572, grievously troubled and steeped in blood such and such a part of France, without leaving any lasting traces in history. Previously to the massacre called the St. Bartholomew, the massacre of Vassy is almost the only one which received and kept its true name. The massacre of Vassy was undoubtedly an accident, a deed not at all forecast or prepared for. The St. Bartholomew Massacre was an event for a long time forecast and announced, promised to the Catholics, and thrown out as a threat to the Protestants, written beforehand, so to speak, in the history of the religious wars of France, but nevertheless, at the moment at which it was accomplished, and in the mode of its accomplishment, a deed unexpected so far as the majority of the victims were concerned, and a cause of contest even among its originators. Accordingly, it was from the very first a subject of surprise and horror throughout Europe as well as in France, not only because of the torrents of blood that were shed, but also because of the extraordinary degree in which it was characterized by falsehood and ferocious hatred. We will bring forward, in support of this double assertion, only such facts and quotations as appear to us decisive. In 1565 Charles the Ninth and Catherine de' Medici had an interview at Bayonne with the Duke of Alba, representative of Philip the Second, to consult as to the means of delivering France from heretics. Quote, they agreed at last, says the contemporary historian Adriani, continuer of Guicciardini, he had drawn his information from the journal of Cosmo de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, who died in 1574 in the opinion of the catholic king who thought that this great blessing could not have accomplishment save by the death of all the chiefs of the huguenots and by a new addition as the saying was of the sicilian vespers take the big fish said the duke of alba and let the small fry go one salmon is worth more than a thousand frogs they decided that the deed should be done at moulins in bourbonnais whither the king was to return the execution of it was afterwards deferred to the date of the st bartholomew in fifteen seventy two at paris because of certain suspicions which had been manifested by the huguenots and because it was considered easier and more certain to get them all together at paris than at moulins end quote. Catherine de' Medici charged Cardinal Santa Croce to assure Pope Pius V quote, that she and her son had nothing more at heart than to get the admiral and all his confidants together some day and make a massacre un macello of them but the matter she said was so difficult that there was no possibility of promising to do it at one time more than at another lanoux bears witness in his memoir to quote, the resolution taken at bayonne with the duke of alba aiding to exterminate the huguenots of france and the beggars or gueux of flanders whereof warning had been given by those about whom there was no doubt 
All these things, and many others as to which I am silent, mightily waked up those, he adds, who had no desire to be caught napping. And I remember that the chiefs of the religion held within a short time three meetings, as well at Valery as at Châtillon, to deliberate upon present occurrences, and to seek out legitimate and honourable expedients for securing themselves against so much alarm, without having recourse to extreme remedies." End quote. De Thou regards these facts as certain, and after having added some details, he sums them all up in the words, quote, This is what passed at Bayonne in 1565. End quote. In 1571, after the third religious war and the peace of Saint Germain en Laye, Marshal de Tavannes wrote to Charles the Ninth, quote, Peace has a chance of lasting, because neither of the two parties is willing or able to renew open war. But if one of the two sees quite a safe opportunity for putting a complete end to what is at the root of the question, this it will take. For to remain for ever in the state now existing is what nobody can or ought to hope for, and there is no such near approximation to a complete victory as to take the persons. For to surprise what they, the reformers, hold, to put down their religion and to break off all at once the alliances which support them, this is impossible. Thus there is no way but to take the chiefs altogether for to make an end of it." End quote. Next year, on the 24th of August, 1572, when the St. Bartholomew broke out, Tavannes took care to himself explain what he meant in 1571 by those words, to take the chiefs altogether for to make an end of it. Being invested with the command in Paris, quote, he went about the city all day, says Brantome, and seeing so much blood spilt, he said and shouted to the people, Bleed! Bleed! The doctors say that bleeding is as good all through this month of August as in May. End quote. In the year which preceded the outbreak of the massacre, when the marriage of Marguerite de Valois with the Prince of Navarre was agreed upon, and Coligny was often present at court, sometimes at Blois and sometimes at Paris, there arose between the king and the queen mother a difference which there had been, up to that time, nothing to foreshadow. It was plain that the union between the two branches, Catholic and Protestant, of the royal house and the patriotic policy of Coligny, were far more pleasing to Charles the Ninth than to his mother. On the matrimonial question, the king's feeling was so strong that he expressed it roughly. Jeanne d'Albret, having said to him one day that the Pope would make them wait a long while for the dispensation requested for the marriage, quote, No, no, my dear aunt, said the king, I honour you more than I do the Pope, and I love my sister more than I fear him. I am not a Huguenot, but no more am I an ass. If the Pope has too much of his nonsense, I will myself take Margot by the hand and carry her off to be married in open conventicle. End quote. Toligny, for his part, was so pleased with the measures that Charles the Ninth had taken in favour of the Low Countries in their quarrels with Philip the Second, and so confident himself of his influence over the king, that when Tavannes was complaining in his presence quote, that the vanquished should make laws for the victors, end quote, Coligny said to his face, quote, Whoever is not for war with Spain is not a good Frenchman, and has the Red Cross inside him. End quote the Catholics were getting alarmed and irritated. The Guises and their partisans left the court. It was near the time fixed for the marriage of Henry of Navarre and Marguerite de Valois. The new Pope, Gregory the Thirteenth, who had at first shown more pliancy than his predecessor Pius V, attached to the dispensation conditions to which neither the intended husband nor King Charles the Ninth himself was inclined to consent. The Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albret, who had gone to Paris in preparation for the marriage, had died there on the 8th of June, 1572, a death which had given rise to very likely ill-founded accusations of poisoning. Quote, a princess, says Daubing, with nothing of a woman but the sex, with a soul full of everything manly, a mind fit to cope with affairs of moment, and a heart invincible in adversity. End quote. It was in deep mourning that her son, become King of Navarre, arrived at court, attended by eight hundred gentlemen, all likewise in mourning. Quote, but, says Margaret de Valois herself, the nuptials took place a few days afterward with such triumph and magnificence as none others of my quality. The King of Navarre and his troop, having changed their mourning for very rich and fine clothes, and I being dressed royally with crown and corset of tufted ermine, all blazing with crown jewels, and the grand blue mantle with a train four ells long, borne by three princesses, the people choking one another down below to see us pass. End quote. The marriage was celebrated on the 18th of August by the Cardinal of Bourbon, in front of the principal entrance of Notre Dame. When the Princess Marguerite was asked if she consented, 
she appeared to hesitate a moment. But King Charles the Ninth put his hand a little roughly on her head, and made her lower it in a token of assent. Accompanied by the King, the Queen Mother, and all the Catholics present, Marguerite went to hear Mass in the choir. Henry and his Protestant friends walked about the cloister and the nave. Marshal de Damville pointed out to Coligny the flags hanging from the vaulted roof of Notre Dame, which had been taken from the vanquished at the Battle of Montcontour. Quote, I hope, said the Admiral, that they will soon have others better suited for lodgment in this place. End quote. He was already dreaming of victories over the Spaniards. Meanwhile, Charles the Ninth was beginning to hesitate. He was quite willing to disconnect himself from the King of Spain, and even to incur his displeasure, but not to be actively embroiled with him, and make war upon him. He could not conceal from himself that this policy, thoroughly French though it was, was considered in France too Protestant for a Catholic king. Coligny urged him vehemently. Quote, if you want men, he said, I have ten thousand at your service. Whereupon Tavan said to the king, quote, Sir, whoever of your subjects uses such words to you, you ought to have his head struck off. How is it that he offers you that which is your own? It is that he has won over and corrupted them, and that he is a party leader to your prejudice. End quote. Tavan, a rough and faithful soldier, did not admit that there could be amongst men moral ties of a higher kind than political ties. Charles the Ninth, too weak in mind and character to think and act with independence and consistency in the great questions of the day, only sought how to elude them, and to leave time, that inscrutable master, to settle them in his place. His indecision brought him to a state of impotence, and he ended by inability to do anything but dodge and lie, like his mother, and even with his mother. Whilst he was getting his sister married to the King of Navarre, and concerting his policy with Coligny, he was adopting towards the three principal personages who came to talk over those affairs with him three different sorts of language. To Cardinal Alessandrino, whom Pope Pius V had sent to him to oppose the marriage, he said, quote, My Lord Cardinal, all that you say to me is sound. I acknowledge it, and I thank the Pope and you for it. If I had any other means of taking vengeance on my enemies, I would not make this marriage, but I have no other. End quote. With Jeanne d'Albret he lauded himself for the marriage as the best policy he could pursue. Quote, I give my sister, he said, not to the Prince of Navarre, but to all the Huguenots, to marry them, as it were, and take from them all doubt as to the unchangeable fixity of my edicts. End quote. And to humour his mother Catherine, he said to her, on the very evening of his interview with Jeanne d'Albret, What think you, madam? Do I not play my partlet well? End quote. Quote, yes, very well, but it is nothing if it is not continued. End quote. And Charles continued to play his part, even after the Bartholomew was over, for he was fond of saying, with a laugh, quote, My big sister Margot caught all these Huguenot rebels in the bird-catching style. What has grieved me most is being obliged to dissimulate so long. End quote. His contemporary Catholic biographer, Papirius Masson, who was twenty-eight years old at the time of the St. Bartholomew, says of him, quote, He is impatient in waiting, ferocious in his fits of anger, skillfully masked when he wishes, and ready to break faith as soon as that appears to his advantage. End quote. Such was the prince, fiery and flighty, inconsistent and artful, accessible to the most opposite sympathies as well as hatreds, of whom Catherine de' Medici and Admiral Coligny were disputing the possession. In the spring of 1572 Coligny might have considered himself the victor in this struggle. At his instance Charles the Ninth had written on the 27th of April to Count Louis of Nassau, leader of the Protestant insurrection in Hainaut. Quote, that he was determined, so far as opportunities and the arrangements of his affairs permitted him, to employ the powers which God had put into his hands for the deliverance of the Low Countries from the oppression under which they were groaning. End quote. Fortified by this promise of the kings, Coligny had raised a body of French Protestants, and had sent it under the command of La Noue to join the army of Louis of Nassau. The reformers had at first had some successes. They had taken Valenciennes and Mons, but the Duke of Alba restored the fortunes of the King of Spain. He re-entered Valenciennes, and he was besieging Mons. Coligny sent to the aid of that place a fresh body of French under the orders of saint -Lis, one of his comrades in faith and arms. Before setting out, saint -Lis saw Charles the Ninth, received from him money together with encouragement, and in the corps he led, some Catholics were mixed with the Protestants but from the very court of france there came to the duke of alba warnings which put him in a position to surprise the french corps and saint was beaten and made prisoner on the tenth of july 
quote, I have in my hands, the Duke of Alba sent word to his king, a letter from the King of France which would strike you dumb if you were to see it. For the moment it is expedient to say nothing about it. End quote. Quote, News of the defeat of Sali, says Tavannes, comes flying to court and changes hearts and counsels. Disdain, despite, is engendered in the admiral, who hurls this defeat upon the heads of those who have prevented the king from declaring himself. He raises a new levy of three thousand foot, and not regarding who he is and where he is, he declares, in the presumption of his audacity, that he can no longer hold his partisans, and that it must be one of two wars, Spanish or civil. It is all thunderstorm at court. Every one remains on the watch at the highest pitch of resolution. End quote. A grand council was assembled. Coligny did not care. He had already, at the king's request, set forth in a long memorial all the reasons for his policy of a war with Spain. The king had appeared struck with them. But, quote, as he only sought, says de Thou, to gain time without its being perceived, end quote, he handed the admiral's memorial to the keeper of the seals, John de Morvilliers, requesting him to set forth also all the reasons for a pacific policy. Coligny, a man of resolution and of action, did not take any pleasure in thus prolonging the discussion. Nevertheless, he again brought forward and warmly advocated at the Grand Council the views he had so often expressed. They were almost unanimously rejected. Coligny did not consider himself bound to give them up. Quote, I have promised, said he, on my own account, my assistance to the Prince of Orange. I hope the King will not take it ill if by means of my friends, and perhaps in person, I fulfil my promise. End quote. This reservation excited great surprise. Quote, Madame, said Coligny to the Queen Mother, the King is today shunning a war which would promise him great advantages. God forbid that there should break out another which he cannot shun. End quote. The Council broke up in great agitation. Quote, let the queen beware, said Tavannes, of the king her son's secret counsels, designs, and sayings. If she do not look out, the Huguenot will have him. At any rate, before thinking of anything else, let her exert herself to regain the mother's authority which the admiral has caused her to lose. End, quote. End of section 41